Good morning, everybody. It's so, so good to see all of you here today. And, and as Daniel, you, Dan, Daniel just mentioned, we, uh, we're, we're in week three of this series entitled Our House. And, and at the beginning of every year, the thing that we like to do is, is we just like to take some time to talk about the church, about, about who it is that we are and who it is that we desire uh, to be, you know, to, to kind of look at the local church, but also the universal church. And, and so in week one of this series, we, we talked about the body and the fact that, that whenever we are, are, are members of the body of Christ, whenever we are Christians, whenever we have been gifted by the Holy Spirit, that, that, that we are all part of one single body. We are many parts to one single body. And everybody who's been gifted by the Holy Spirit, that gift was not given to you for the sole purpose of you being able to just like hoard it and say, oh, look what I have. But, but, but that gift was given to you for the common good of the entire church. For the entire local church, and, and in turn, for the entire universal church as well. But then in, in week two, we kind of looked at, 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 at this teaching that, that we see all throughout the New Testament, from, from Jesus to, to James, to where James puts it this way. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Because whenever you do what the word says, all of a sudden you become more like Jesus. And, and in turn, whenever you become more like Jesus, G Jesus, because you're a part of this body, we become more like Jesus. And, and honestly, that's like the ultimate goal of the entire thing is, is for us, you know, our, our number one value is, is for everybody to have a transformational relationship with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, through obeying his words, that we all become more like Jesus. Whenever we do that individually, in the end, we end up doing that collectively as well. Now, a, a few years ago, there's an author by the name of Tom Rainer, and, and Tom Rainer, he does all kinds of church statistics and, and different things like that, and, 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 and so much has changed, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, so much has changed in the world over the past few years, over the past couple of years, but, but, but there's still so much good in this, the, the, this book. The, it's a tiny little book, and it's called I Am a Church Member. And in this book, he provides this little survey to identify what he calls a me centered church or a me centered christian and, and and this is what he he says in the survey he says that 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 a me centered church is 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 a church that that uh is constantly fighting like the worship wars you guys remember worship wars we i'm, I'm sure that, that, that we've all gone through those in some way that that a me centered church is is a facility focused church like the facility is for people who who say i'm a part of of of, of this church but you know not really something uh, for, for the community, a, 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 a me-centered church has an inwardly focused budget. A me-centered church has attitudes of, of entitlement. A me-centered church uh, experiences, often experiences anger and hostility. A me-centered church has evangelistic apathy. And a me-centered church has greater concern about change that might take place rather than concern for the gospel. And as, as you can tell, whenever it comes to a me-centered church, the common thread in a me-centered church is that everything is about me. It's about what I like. It's about what I want. It's about what makes me comfortable. It, 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 it's, it's all about me. And we said in, in week one of this series that, that we want to be a dangerous church. Well, a me-centered church is a dangerous church but not in the good way of being a dangerous church. A me-centered church is dangerous because ultimately it leads to a me-centered faith, and a me-centered faith leads to a me-centered Christian, and, and it's, imp it, it's impossible to live a me -centered, have a me-centered faith as a me-centered Christian while, while living the life that Jesus desires for us to live at the exact same time. Those things cannot coexist. And so a, a me-centered church full of me-centered Christians, they will always, always, always struggle to reach people who are far from Jesus. And a me-centered church will often look around and they will be frustrated by the lack of impact that they're having. And they will look in every single place they possibly can for why they're not getting the impact that they think that they should. But they'll never look in the place that, it, that that's the root of the problem. The root of the problem is this, is that it is impossible for a me-centered Christian 
to live the life that Jesus desires for you to live. Why? Because it is impossible for a me-centered Christian to love as Jesus has loved us. Sometimes I, I wonder, maybe you've you know, had similar thoughts in your life. I, I, I just wonder if, if Jesus ever looks at what takes place. And if you ever asked him this, the, asked himself this question, like, how could I have made it any clearer? Right? Like, like, how could I have made my intentions any clearer? And I don't think Jesus does this because Jesus is so much greater than, than, than I am, obviously. But, you know, like, like, how could I have made it any clearer? Like the last night of, of Jesus' life, that, that, that last night that he had with his disciples. And if you've been around here long, you've heard us talk about this text. And I promise you, I'm going to keep talking about this text over and over and over again. But, but this last night, Jesus, he has his disciples with him. He knows what lies ahead of him. And just within a matter of hours, he's about to be crucified. He's about to be buried. Within a few days, he will resurrect. Within a, a, a few weeks after that, he will end up ascending into heaven. He knows that this is one of the last times that he is going to have his disciples together on this earth. And so he, he decides, here, here, here's what I want them to know. Here's what I feel like I need to tell them. Here's what they need to know so that way, whenever I'm gone, whenever I'm no longer here, they know everything that they need to do to make sure that this mission, that, 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 that this message, this hope that Jesus provides is able to continue long after Jesus has ascended into heaven. And so he says this in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, by this love for one another, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Everyone will know that you belong to me. Everyone will know that you are a follower of Jesus if you love one another. But that's not the only time over the course of this evening that he said this. I mean, just a little bit later on in the night, he says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. And then uh, just a couple of breaths later, he says, this is my command. Love each other. Do you think he was trying to get something across to him? And the interesting thing that I, I think we so often overlook when, with Jesus' words is, is I, I think we see it with the great commission, like the great command is, is what, in, in Matthew chapter 8. Like, like, like we, we look at the great commission, we say, yeah, that's a really good idea, Jesus. Thanks for mentioning it. Like, like it's just a suggestion, but it was so much more than a suggestion. Therefore, go into all nations, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I have taught you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is not a suggestion. That is a command. The exact same way that Jesus is not saying, a new suggestion that I have for you. My suggestion is this. No, this is the command of Jesus, to love as he has loved us. And so much of who we are as a church and so much of who we desire to be as a church, it is tied to these words that Jesus said to his disciples just hours before he was crucified. And the reason why we hold these words in such high regard is not simply because Jesus spoke them, although I hope we can all agree that would be enough. But it was also because the early church leaders, the early church disciples and, and, and the apostles, it is so, so clear that these words, that this teaching was a core component to their ministry and to their leading. Listen to how Peter puts it in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says this, above all, like, like at the very, very top of the list, number one, top of the list, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Pretty much John, you know, the, the, the Apostle John, the entire book of 1 John, the entire letter of 1 John is largely around this idea, but definitely chapter 4 in, in, in 1 John, he says this, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister, that person is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen, they cannot love God whom they have not seen. And then you have the Apostle Paul, this, this one who, who is credited with bringing the, the gospel message to the Gentiles, the, the, the one for many of us, you know, who, who kind of started the movement that brought us to this place. 
today, uh, allowing the message to, to, to get to people, uh, to, to this church in, in Galatia, in, in Galatia, in Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, or excuse me, in chapter 5, he says this, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor un- uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And so you, you get this idea of, of he's talking to these, the, this Gentile group of believers, but they have this, this Jewish group of believers who's coming in saying, yes, I know you have, I, I know that, 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 that you've been baptized, I know that you've accepted what Jesus has done for you, but you also need to be circumcised. You also you need to add something on to what Jesus has done for you. And anytime we start hearing messages of you need to add to what Jesus has already done, we need to turn around and run the other way as fast as we possibly can. But here he, they're, they're saying you need to add on to what Jesus has already done. And so Paul's like, no, 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 no. None of that stuff that you're doing to try and gain credibility, none of that stuff that you're doing to try and gain the love of Jesus, none of it has any value. But the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then just a couple of breaths later, he says this, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And we hear that. And for many of us who maybe you've grown up in church, that sounds pretty familiar, right? It sounds familiar because it was a core teaching that Jesus gave over and over and over again. The the place where, where we see it so clearly is in Matthew chapter 22. When Jesus is, 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 is uh, kind of put on the spot by some of these teachers and these religious leaders, and, and they're trying to ask Jesus, out of all the 600 plus commands, out of all these things, what is the most important one? Come on, Jesus, there's so many options. What do you choose? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And all the Jewish people standing around, they would have been like, that's right. That's right. That's what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're all on the same page here. Jesus, we're, we're, we're good. Like for, for one of the very first time, the Jewish leaders and Jesus, they were good. But then Jesus, he continued. He said, this is the first and greatest commandment, but the second is like it. I love the New Living Translation. It says the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself for all the law. And all the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. And it's almost as if Jesus was, was in his mind, he, he was thinking, you know what? Throughout history, people are going to read that. And they're going to say, that's good, Jesus, but there has to be something more. That's good, but, but that's really too simple. Like, Jesus, I need a checklist. Jesus, I'm a checklist kind of guy. What do I need to do to make sure that I'm living the life that you want me to do? I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And Jesus like, no, 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 no. I need you to love God, and I need you to love people. And there's this one occasion in the New, in the New Testament, this incredible, incredible opportunity that Jesus has given to explain exactly what this looks like. In Luke chapter 10, It says that on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus asked him this question. Well, what is it that's written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, well, then I must love the Lord your God. You you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And so he just quoted those words of Moses again from Deuteronomy 6, but it's likely that this man had already heard Jesus' teaching on this. And so I just wonder if he kind of gives Jesus a little wink or a little smile, you know, because he just gave the answer that everybody would agree with, and he's like, but I know you've said something more. So here you go. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, well, you have answered answered correctly. Do this. And you will live. And honestly, that should have been the end of the conversation. So often, whenever it comes to the the way that we interact with Jesus, we we know exactly what the answer is. We we know exactly what it is that we're supposed to do. But then we do exactly what this guy does in verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself. 
I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what you're calling me to do. I know what you've told me to do, but Jesus, can, can we just talk about this a little bit more real quick? I know you've made it really, really clear, but can we just go a little bit deeper here? Like, like I, I'm actually really good here, Jesus. Like, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I, I really love people really, really well. So, so let me, you know, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. And so he asked Jesus, okay, but who, who is my neighbor? And this question was completely an attempt to try and limit who his neighbor is might be my neighbor or the people who share my street, right? The pe- my, my, my neighbor are, are, are the people who live in my neighborhood. My neighbors are, are the people who live in my community. My neighbors are the people who, who I, I, I go to church with. My, my neighbors are the people who I go to school with. My, my neighbors are the people that I, 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 I work with. Like, like those are my neighbors. My neighbors are the people who think like me. My neighbors are the people who look like me. My neighbors are the people who, who talk like me. Like, like those are who my neighbors are, right? Jesus, that's what you're telling me? Like the people who think like me and look like me and talk like me and act like me and, and live by me and, and work with me? Like, like you're telling me that I need to go, like, that's my neighbor. And Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem. This is presumably a a Jewish man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And on his way, he was attacked by robbers. And they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. And then they went away, leaving him half Dead. And, and this trek, the, the, this trip that this, this man was going on in this story that, that Jesus is telling, this was such a dangerous, dangerous trip. It, from, from, from Jerusalem to Jericho was approximately a 17-mile trip. And in the 17 miles, you went down about 3,000 feet. And so it is a winding, it is a, a treacherous road, it is a path that was literally known as the way of blood because of the number of robberies and the number of jumpings and, and the number of, of murders that took place on this path. It provided the perfect, the perfect layout for a robber to be able to hide behind rocks or, or hide in little clefts of rocks and, and, and as somebody's winding and coming down this road to be able to jump them and, 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 and be able to, to rob them and and so this is what was taking place here. And, and so you have this man who he's been robbed, he's been jumped, he's been beaten, he's, he's being left for dead, right? But it just so happened, it just so happened that, that, that a priest happened to be going down the road at the exact same time. Like, I mean, that, that, that's such a, a, a great thing, right? I mean, surely this religious man is going to come and, and do something about this man who would say that he loved God. Surely he's going to see the pain and the suffering and the, 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 the danger that this person is in, and, and surely he's going to step in and do something. But, but when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. I just wonder... Maybe this guy who had just gotten jumped, maybe he still had some level of consciousness. And I just wonder if whenever he looked and if he saw the priest, whenever he saw the religious man coming, I just wonder if he thought, oh, thank you, God. You've sent someone my way. You've sent someone to save me. Only to have the religious man get as far away from him and pass by on the other side of the road. But then a Levite, another religious person, when he came to the place and he saw him, he also went to the other side of the road and he passed by. And so so we can come up with all kinds of reasons. We can come up with all kinds of reasons, but, but what we have is we have a man who is hanging on to life by a thread, a man who is in desperate need of some sort of help and attention. And you have religious people who know the words of Moses. You have religious people who, who, who know the Old Testament, who, who know that the, the God is a God who, who desires mercy and compassion, and, 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 and yet they pass on the other side. And I mean, there are so many reasons that we could give why they did that. Maybe they were just in a hurry, right? If I, if I, maybe they had an appointment. If I didn't have this appointment, then I would have stopped. Then I would have helped. Maybe... 
Maybe they were terrified. Maybe they thought that the robbers were still around, and if they stopped, then they too would end up being jumped and, and, and beaten. Or, or maybe they thought that this guy was actually faking and that he wasn't really hurt. And, 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 and so whenever they show up, you know, it's, it's like, you know, if, if I go there and, and he's faking, and if he ends up jumping me, then, then I'm helping nobody. So, I mean, I probably should just make sure that I stay, stay safe or... Or maybe, maybe they were on their way to the temple. And because they were going to the temple, they were going to worship, they knew that, that, that if they went and if they helped this man, that all of a sudden they would be considered unclean by the temple standard. And, and, and so, so they cannot help this man and go worship God. And if it comes down to worshiping God or helping a person, surely God would want me to go worship him instead of help. Right? I mean, we can come up with all the reasons and all the excuses, but regardless, regardless of what, is, of what they're thinking was, Jesus is making it so, so clear throughout this story that we are to love others even whenever we are busy, that we are to love others as Jesus has loved us even when it may cost us something, that we are to love others as Jesus has loved us even when it may go against our own rituals or our own traditions. And so this Jewish leader, he hears this story and it's not going the direction that he wants. He wanted the priest to be the hero. He wanted the Levite to be a hero. But then these next three words come out of Jesus' mouth. And the, the, this man who had initially asked the question is just like, oh my word, I should have just stopped whenever I was ahead. Because Jesus says, but a Samaritan, but a Samaritan, and you can imagine this teacher of the law's face as he hears these words. All of a sudden, whenever the priest was coming, his face lit up. Whenever the Levite was coming, his face lit up. But a Samaritan, and all of a sudden, his face, it just drops. Because the, the, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they had a long, long-standing rivalry. And, and they would never help one another. They would never do something for one another. The, the, the Samaritans were the hated half-breed, the, 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 the long history of, 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 of destroying each other's places of worship and, and just having this bitter, bitter rivalry. The Jews went so far that whenever they, they would never even pass through Samaria. They created their own little paths whenever they had to go from north to south so that way they could make sure that they stayed out of Samaria because they wanted nothing to do with them. But here Jesus is about to make the Samaritan, the bad guy, into the hero. He says, but, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, he, he came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and, and, and wine, and he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then the next day, he took two denarii, which was the, uh, the equivalent of two days' wages, and, and gave them to the innkeeper, which would have been enough for the innkeeper to take care of him for at least a few weeks. And, and he asked him to look after him and said, when I return, I will reimburse you for whatever extra expenses that you may have. And so you, you have the, the religious leaders who, who literally get as far away from the pain as they possibly can. And you have the enemy who goes straight up to it and takes care of the man. And so Jesus then asked the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the expert replied, I love this so much. The one who had mercy on him, he could not even bring himself to say the Samaritan. It was too dirty of a word to come out of his mouth. So he just says, the one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. The church... Here in a couple of months, I'm going to be 40 years old. <laughs> Appreciate it. To some of you, you're like, holy smokes, that dude's old. To some of you, you're saying, ah, oh, you're just a baby.
But I believe that right now, more than any other point in my life in these 40 years, there is more brokenness in this world right now than any other point in my lifetime. Now, if you're over 40, you can answer that however you want. But the amount of brokenness, the amount of pain, the amount of shame that people are living with, the, the, the fact that we are in a day and an age, I don't, I mean, regardless of what you think about, about you know, stimulus or, or any of those things, we are at a day and age with, with, with the inflation the way that it is, that there are literally families who are looking at themselves right now and saying, I don't know how I'm going to keep putting food on the table. It is impossible for us as Jesus followers to stay away from brokenness today. We don't have the option of just crossing over to the other side of the street and continuing to go on. You look around the world, and I mean, throughout the last couple of years, you can see it. You find whatever statistic you want. It shows you that the mental illness in this world is skyrocketing right now. It shows you that drug abuse is skyrocketing right now. It shows you that suicide is skyrocketing right now. And we cannot get away from it. But please listen to me, church. Because of the hope of Jesus Christ, it should never be our intention to get away from it. It should always be our intention to run to it. Because you look at everything that is taking place. You look at the pain. You look at the suffering. You look at the questions and the doubts and the loneliness. You look at all of it. And you have to come to this place to where we can understand that because of Jesus... Because of Jesus, that there is no different level. Nobody is better than anybody else. That whenever it comes to the cross, we all stand on level ground. We are all broken sinners in desperate need of amazing grace. But so often, our tendency, whenever we see pain, and brokenness and hurt is to come up with all the reasons why we should not engage. And just across to the other side of the street, pass by. But man, may it be true for us that whenever the world sees us coming, that they see agents of hope. Whenever the world sees us coming, they see people who are not willing to just get on the other side of the road, but because of Jesus, we believe that all people can be reconciled to a holy God. And if all people can be reconciled to a holy God, then by all means, we all can be reconciled with one another. And all of that is true because of the cross. Every single pain that we see in this world, Jesus is the answer. He's the answer for it all. But do you want to know how that answer gets to the broken? Whenever we decide to engage brokenness instead of passing by on the other side of the street. So may our neighbors, whenever they see us coming, may, may they know that, that an agent of hope is on the way. This is the entire reason that we are here. The entire reason we are here is not so that we have a building that is full of people who look like us and think like us and talk like us and believe everything that we believe at this moment in time. But the reason we are here is because we believe that God has called all people unto himself and he's made a way through Jesus Christ. And we want to share that message with every single person we possibly can. 
So may we be a group of people that we think like Jesus, we see like Jesus, we feel like Jesus, we respond and we act like Jesus. It was several years ago, I was sitting and having lunch with a, I mean, this, this older gentleman who I just had so, so much respect for. And um, he passed away a, a few years ago, but we were having lunch and, and, and he, he asked me, this question. He goes, hey, Andy, I want you to go home and I want you to think about what kind of what is the mission for your life and why do you do what you do? And I said, with all due respect, Mr. Markham, I don't need to go home and think about that one. I already know. The mission for me has always been found in Matthew chapter 9 where it says that Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. In verse 36, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Brokenness is everywhere. You want to know one of the hardest things about where we find ourselves in the world today and in this community? It's this community more than any other community I've ever been a part of tries to hide their brokenness. They try to hide their shame. They try to hide their pain. But do you want to know who you cannot hide your, your, your shame and your pain from for very long? Your neighbor. They see what's going on in your house. They see your countenance whenever you come out the front door. They know, I mean, they they, they have an idea whether, whether you're close or whether you're not just from what they see. They have an idea of what you're facing. And as we face all this brokenness, once again, I just want to plead with you, with us. Even in the midst of our brokenness, can we always, can we please just keep our eyes focused on Jesus? May we be able to keep our hope found in Jesus. And may we be able to take that hope everywhere we go and to every person that we encounter. May we do more than simply listen to the word and so deceive ourselves. May we do what it says. May we do more than look at this story that Jesus tells and says, oh, Jesus, that's such a great, that, that, that's such a great story. That's such a great suggestion. That's such a great idea. Wow, I hope somebody really listens to this. <laughs> may we move beyond that. And may we move into the place of go and do likewise. Church. May we see the example of Jesus, and may we go and do likewise. As a partner at LeClaire Christian Church, I will be faithful with the gifts God has entrusted to me in order to make the body complete. When another part of the body is hurting or down, I will do what I can to lift them up. As a partner at LeClaire Christian Church, I will be an encourager. As a partner at LeClaire Christian Church, I will always be welcoming of new people regardless of where they're from, or their walk of life. As a partner at LeClaire Christian Church, I will handle any and all tension that comes my way with love. As a partner at LeClaire Christian Church, I will do all of this because I believe that Jesus is the hope of the entire world, and we, his church, are the vehicle he has chosen to use to share that hope. Church, that's a big deal. Can you pray with me this morning? Jesus, I thank you for for your word. And God, I do pray that you will help us to have our eyes wide open. Father, that we will understand that that as we encounter brokenness, that, that those are moments that you have called us into. Jesus, may we be bold. May we be compassionate. May we be humble. Jesus, we we just want to hear you We want to follow your example and go and do likewise. Jesus, we love you so, so much. It's in your name we pray.